I now call this meeting of the Amateur Detective Club to order. My name is Tristan Miller, the Saucy Sleuth. I'm Melissa Maley, the Spy. I'm Tyler Riley, Cop and a Half. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod and browse the unmatched selections of audio programs. Download a title free. It's that easy. Just go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod. I think I missed like half And a start second. listening. It's oh, that easy. I wasn't reading. <laughs> you almost got it. I think it's good enough for government work. Ugh. Um, well, I mean, that's not saying much these days. <laughs> <laughs> Big shrug. <laughs> um, I mean, I recommend cards on the table. What we, I don't know what another recommendation would be. How about the ABC murders? Oh. Which oh, we've uh, recommended that. Before. Yeah. <laughs> we have. We can recommend wonder... something again. That's fair. I, that's true. I, I wonder why we've recommended that book before. Because we read it. Yeah. <laughs> Not that long ago. Yeah, admittedly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's why. And I'm going to be real, real, real with you. Oh, boy. That's why I was on Twitter for most of watching this episode. It's like, I know. Oh, okay. It. <laughs> it's pretty um, fresh in the mind. Yeah, precisely. Um. So, uh, we start with um, Poirot picking Hastings up from the train. In what? What are we watching? Oh, we're watching the ABC Murders season four, episode one. one. Yeah. Of Agatha Christie's Poirot. Which is um, a feature length episode. Yeah, it's a movie. It's a, oh. basically a made for TV movie. Um, yeah. Which. And we'll probably get this into it more during the review section, but I really enjoyed the format, though it is an hour and 45 minutes. So it's like a full movie. Yeah, um, and once you accept that. Yeah. <laughs> and you just let it just sit in your gut. Um, <laughs> you feel it in your organs. In your... <laughs> mm, could have gone with bones, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we start by Poirot picking up Hastings from the train, right? Yeah. The station? Yeah, because he's and... been in South America and, uh, mm -hmm. took the train all the way back to London. <laughs> 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 I assume. <laughs> Why not? <sighs> you know? <laughs> uh, but he, he has Poirot, brought I with saw him... a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. what, Tyler? Uh, Hastings has brought with him uh, a little a little playmate for Poirot. <laughs> <laughs> a stuffed, it's not a crocodile. What is it? He says it it's like a caiman. Time. It's a, a caiman, that's right. Which, Which is, is like in the family, but it's a it's a smaller small. yeah. yeah. It's like a it's like a carry around size of crocodile. Yeah, baby's first it's a lap crocodile, croc, if you will. <laughs> if this were and I can let me be completely honest about this, that uh Dead animals are upsetting to me. Mm. I have I am a very conflicted omnivore. Uh, I try to reduce all of that stuff. However, uh, and if this were a mammal, I would not have been able to stomach it. But there mm. is this dead animal, and it is used for comedy. If that is upsetting to anyone, maybe fast forward through those bits. Um, yeah, fifteen minutes in, and then they stop doing it. Uh, it's a little bit of a running thing. <laughs> yeah. However, however, because it was also very clearly not real, I was yeah. able to find. <laughs> yeah, I was able to find a lot of humor in this. Uh, they went down to build a bit. bear. <laughs> yeah. So pretend it's a build a bear caiman. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but it's this very upsetting looking. Like, gosh, it's the size of. A, a small dog. Uh, I wouldn't say small dog. A medium. A medium-sized dog. It's the size of my very large Boston Terrier, at least. <laughs> like, um, I'd say collie-sized. Sure. It's a collie-sized reptile. Uh, uh, 
And uh, Hastings is trying to tell him the entire story at the train station. And Pora's like, uh, perhaps we go back to the flat? No? So we don't want to keep the train operators because they yeah. have to stay here. And he's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. He's like, duh. And I love uh, the acting work by the extras that are playing oh like the the porters. Yeah, they're bedraggled. They're beleaguered. They're bejeweled. They're bedazzled. Yeah, um, it's, it's just clearly this is going to be a very long story about how he shot this animal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so then they get a taxi and he keeps bumping Poirot <laughs> with <laughs> Kane. Yeah. It's pretty good, actually. Honestly, it's pretty yeah. solid. Like, if you're going to do a bit of physical comedy, it's pretty good. It yeah. is. It's- that's pretty good. Yeah. But um, Poro is explaining that he's been see- receiving these letters, right? This is when he lays that down. No, uh, mm-hmm. Well, when they get back to the office. Oh. Okay. And when he officially yeah. gives the Cayman as a <laughs> present to Poro. <laughs> Which, God bless Poro, he goes along with it. Oh, yeah. yeah a little I... bit too much, though. Yeah. At first, uh, uh, he's telling Hastings, like, uh, hey, can you put that in your room? Because... <laughs> I would rather not have it around here. And Hastings is, looks very crestfallen. He says, oh, it was supposed to be a present for you. And, <laughs> and Poro's like, oh, oh it is? Uh, uh, that's what a thoughtful so thing nice. you've done. Yeah. Oh, I it smells. Mean, I love the smell of this dead animal in my it, home. Uh, it <laughs> Thank you ever to, so much. To England. The jungle is what he says, I believe. Yeah, and at some point uh, in the ensuing scenes, uh, Hastings like puts it on the the side table and is like mm-hmm. trying to find a spot for it. It's very funny. It reminds me of um, if you've ever watched Scrubs. Yes. Yeah, um, they have a stuffed German, no, a stuffed golden retriever. Yeah. Mm. Because it used to be one of the characters, and I believe one of the like writer's actual dogs that they had taxidermied when it passed away which is weird i don't want to um, cast aspersions yeah but yeah perhaps i don't remember but anyway it reminded but, me a lot of scrubs yeah yeah it it is not for me <laughs> no when something when a creature is dead it is dead i do not need it in my home thank you Oh, my grandfather apparently shot some deer. My grandmother's house, I believe, still has one of the heads in in their den. I'm sorry. I heard my grandfather shot some deer in my grandmother's house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how did they get in there? How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. But yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I mean, like, we had a couple of situations, like, growing up in South Dakota, we had a lot of, like, stuffed pheasants and whatnot, and, like, my mom refused to have them in the home because she thought they were tacky, and I'm like, I, I think I agree with that. Uh, I don't think things should be taxidermied now. If you have a taxidermied animal, like, I guess you should display it because it's already done, but, like, it's not, I don't prefer it. How do you feel about the Museum of Natural History? I love it. But those Budget are tax- those aren't taxidermied animals, are they? They oh, are. Yes. Um yeah, I believe a lot of them are. They're not just very good statues. I will google it. Let's see. Oh boy. Let's see. So they... Okay. So that's different. Are people doing that now? Like at uh, wakes? Like they're propping up like the dead bodies and people are like parting like around the body. It's like propped on a chair. I feel like that's a Florida thing that started happening like a couple years ago. Okay. That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Florida. <laughs> Don't don't lie. Don't speak for all of us. Come on. I love people from Florida. I love many people in Florida. I love everyone who made it out. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do, Melissa. Yes. 
is not tell you what my Google search gave. So you can, Schrodinger style, believe whatever you want. They're absolutely taxidermied, aren't they? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so we receive a... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. A lot of them are. From my understanding, there's a couple of, like... They they put a lot of effort into preserving them. That's mostly what the articles that... I mean, the thing is, it's a museum, so it's a little different than having them in your home. Yes. I, I don't think yeah. you should have stuffed animals in the home. Um, and a lot of them, because the way the collection started was a lot of them were shot and... I don't believe taxidermy, but were were collected by um, Theodore Roosevelt himself. <laughs> so, he went around shooting things, stuffing them, and putting them in. <laughs> yeah, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, that's why there's a statue of Theodore Roosevelt outside the Museum of Natural yeah, you found History. Yeah, the museum. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm learning all sorts of things. Did he? How did he, yeah. I? I didn't know any of this. No, that I makes... don't know. I love Theodore Roosevelt. Anyway, so they get <laughs> you're saying Tyler. <laughs> so we get our first letter. <laughs> yes. And yeah, it's a letter that Poirot received a month prior. He tells Hastings, mm-hmm. uh, and I believe it's a bit different in the book in terms of like how long he had the correspondence with. Uh, the writer who is revealed to be ABC. That Perhaps is how so. the letter is signed. And it informs Poirot that a, some crime is to be committed in the town of Andover mm-hmm. on a specific date. Do you think that town got its name by it's like, well, you go over the hill and over and over and over and then you'll be there? <laughs> Well, it's uh, right next to the town of Fist. <laughs> and over Fist. <laughs> oh, I got it. Oh, that's quite good. That's far, that's far better than mine. Way to go. Nice oh. job. Nicely done. Mm-hmm. But uh, Hastings is like, all right, what are we about to do? Are we going to Andover? Like, it's, it's supposed to happen today. Like, why are we not there? And he's like, oh ever one to like go into action and Hastings is like yeah someone's telling us that like a crime is about to happen <laughs> yeah yeah Hastings is right murder. on yeah, yeah. Hastings just, is pretty right on this one we just yeah. we just talked in the car about how horny we both were for murder like aren't we <laughs> <laughs> that was the conversation Paul Rowe is like now that you are here I think something good will happen yeah and they're like, like it was so oddly sexual to me <laughs> <laughs> it might be just me in quarantine that is just going through something. <laughs> you know, the strange quarantine thoughts that we all have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it certainly, actually, I had a similar note. Not this, it, it didn't read as sexual to me, um, but I did really like how much, like, love there was between these two people. Like, they clearly really like each other by now. Yeah. And same with them and Jab. Yeah. And that was something that struck me about all the performances that were really, it, was, it was really, really good. Yeah, throughout this, it just seemed like, like, Jap, uh, Poirot, and Hastings, like, have, like, shed any, you know, um, hesitancy, for lack of a better term, in their performances. Like, they are, like, settled in the skins of, uh, of these characters at this point. And I really just noticed that in, uh, the car scene preceding the office scene so i feel like the like boop sorry thing like with the cayman was like i feel like that just happened naturally mm-hmm. i feel like that wasn't in the script uh, oh gosh i hope i hope it wasn't and that's brilliant <laughs> oh so good uh yes so uh they get a call or jeff gets a call or somebody gets a call there's been yeah. a murder uh it is what, Alice Asher in Andover? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so they run over to Andover, try to figure out what happened. The immediate suspect is her estranged husband. Mm-hmm. Um, her German first, husband. Yeah, we get our first bit of... of is it racism? It's not nationalism, because that means something else. Xenophobia? Xenophobia. 
Yeah. yeah. Our first bit where they're like, clearly he did it. He's a German. And it's like, oh, well. But he was also very, <laughs> very drunk and very loud and very um, violent. Right. Verbally. Um, very. Uh, they didn't have a good marriage. That's why they're separated. Of course, he's the first suspect. That makes a lot of absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Poirot is like, hey, I did get these letters. Um, but it's pretty quickly uh, dismissed that he could have done, he uh, he meaning the husband could have done it. Yeah. Because um, he had, I believe, an alibi. Yes, he does. And what I love about this adaptation is in the book, this is like two chapters of them trying to get the, because Poirot's, it's like, not him, not him, not him. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, we can't just assume that you're right. And he's like, why not? And so they just get rid of this guy in like a matter of five minutes or something. And I really appreciated them not staying there. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. He gets like one scene. It's really neat. Um, <clears throat> Very tidy. Yeah, exactly. I did mean tidy. Uh, so they're like, okay, unsolved murder. Uh, Poirot gets another letter. And it says... I guess you're not so clever, Poirot. Come and catch me. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, he gives a date and a town. Bexel on... In, like, a day or two. or Yeah. A, yeah. So, I... Uh, and sure enough, I... Uh, they go to Bexel and uh, we get a scene of a dog discovering... Uh, the body of a young woman. Uh, well, is... uh, sorry to cut you off there, but uh, mm. p- preceding that just a bit, uh, mm. they meet with the superintendent of Bexhill. Oh, uh, okay. And it's Hastings, Poirot, and Jap mm-hmm. all there, and they're going through like what precautions they can take because, like, it's supposedly the small resort town. So Jap is like, well, just you know it's a small town like just keep an eye on people with bees like just make sure like everyone's mm-hmm. you know safe like you have enough people for that and he's yeah. like well actually it's the summer and the beginning of the holiday season so people are flooding to the town right now it's mm-hmm. not as simple as that right. yeah and you get this wonderful airplane with a ribbon that says bexel is bonnie which i thought yeah. was quite charming oh yeah that was great <laughs> yeah uh but we discover the dog discovers the body, and it is a young woman who works as a waitress at uh, one of the local resorts, I believe. Yeah. Um, and what is her name? It starts with a B, of course. Oh, my gosh. Let me look it up. Oh, wow. None of us remember. Let <laughs> me look it up. I, uh, I remember the friend. I don't remember. Well, the friend is around for longer. Right. <laughs> Her name uh, is like Rebecca and then something with a B, so her nickname could have been Becky. It's Megan yeah. Bernard, who is her cousin, I believe. Or sister. It's her sister. Her sister. Yeah, I Megan her is her sister. Is Bernard, but what's her Bern- Mr. Bernard? I think it's Rebecca. Okay. I think it's Rebecca. I think it's Rebecca so that it could be Becky. Um, oh, I know Rebecca Bernard. Oh. She's a, she's a really nice lady and a clown. Oh, oh fun. Uh, yes. So, she has been discovered murdered. They say that she has a fiancé and that they don't really like him. <laughs> so, maybe he did it. Um, right. And they have a little discussion with him. Uh, nothing really promising pans out, though. No. Uh, so... Poirot and Hastings are drinking some soup at the flat uh, later. They're, by the way, collecting people along the way. They're, yes. they're collecting, like, um, the niece of Mrs. Asher, who mm-hmm. was murdered That's in was Andover. Yeah. yeah. And then the fiancé and the, um, the sister of... Of Miss Barna- Bernard, 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 yeah, Bernard, uh, Bernard. 
but yeah, there's a <laughs> there is a really funny moment where Hastings goes, "Are you Miss Bernard?" And she's, "Yes, I'm Miss Bernard," <laughs> and like corrects him. It's very fun. Yeah, um, um, yeah, and she's I, very pretty, and Hastings is, oh, looks um, immediately. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> She's also like, kind of, like, no-nonsense and sassy, which Hastings yeah. likes, too. Yes. Yes. Uh. Absolutely his type. Um, but what's interesting, two things. Um, one is, in the book, this is it takes place after Hastings is married. Um, right. Yes. Whereas in this, he's not. Mm-hmm. But he still has the same reaction in the book, where he's yep. like, ah. and, he, and Poirot's like, dude, you just came from your wife in South Africa. <laughs> Not South Africa, sorry, South, South America. America. Yeah. Listen, my uh, my mother had a saying mm-hmm. um, when she would notice a handsome gentleman. She would say, just because I'm on a diet doesn't mean I can't read the menu. <laughs> my mother also had a saying, which was, <laughs> keep your eyes on the road. Oh, God, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... At any um, rate. I had another thing I wanted Betty. to say. <laughs> oh, Betty. 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 Elizabeth Bernard. Betty. Oh, okay. That's it. Yeah. Patricia. Um, so here's the other thing. Um, I'm. You said something a while back, Melissa. You said oh. drinking some soup. And I want to get it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to hear Tyler's thoughts. Do you eat <laughs> soup or do you drink soup? I, I do both. Mm, I begin by eating the one. soup, and then when it gets to be just, you know, the broth or whatever, then I'll sip it or drink it. Okay, okay. Do you know, I I've think... never said drinking soup in my life, I don't think, <laughs> until this episode. <laughs> That's fantastic. Because that, that was fascinating. But I think you drink a, you know, you certainly drink the broth. No one can make an argument there. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. do you eat ice or do you drink ice? What is, you know... Nothing. Nothing. You don't do that with ice. You leave it in You've your drink. You never put ice in your mouth and just gone to town. Then you eat it. Yes. <laughs> what if you like sit and you just let it melt in your mouth? I've done that before. Yeah. Is that drinking ice? No. Or is that eating? It's ice? water nope. at that point. It's neither. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, steam is just the ghost of ice. <laughs> That's a joke that I wrote a while ago. I'm letting people know I didn't come up with that just now. <laughs> so, uh, is that what this whole speech. tangent has been about? So you could say <laughs> the ghost of ice. <laughs> we have a five hour movie to get through. <laughs> it just James keeps. Is like, this thing's too long. It just keeps increasing in length. They meet with Betty's employer at the resort. They don't get much information from her, except, like, we know that she was uh, attached to Donald Frazier as her beau, her man, her main squeeze, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And that she was dismissed from work at 11. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, next we go to the family's house where Poirot uh, starts questioning uh, the immediate family of Betty. Yeah, and they don't really find very much out. Do they find out about... Does Megan mention that... At some point, Megan, her sister, mentions that um, her mom had just bought her some stockings, and she gets very upset looking at these stockings because she'd never gotten to see them. Yes. Mm. Yes. And then Poirot Mm. has... Uh, a eureka moment based on no, uh, a little while. Okay, but um, it all put it together. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, I uh, we're sitting with the soup and the newspaper, and the late post mm. uh, at Poirot's flat comes. This is a couple days later, because uh, we've kind of reached a a point where they're stymied. Um, about both of the murders. But the police are starting to realize, yeah, okay, this is probably connected. And we haven't gotten a letter to Poirot from ABC in a little while. So the late post, they get a letter to Poirot that had been misaddressed um, and finally had to be 
it had like a bunch of scribbles on it. It's like, do you mean this? Maybe it's this one. So it looks like the postal service in uh, in the UK had been like going around and trying to figure it out, which is really nice and refreshing. That when yeah. something had been misaddressed, they were like, hmm. Let's do a little detective work about this piece of mail and where it should actually go. Um, so it finally comes to them, and it's evening time. They're sitting with their soup, and realize they realize that in this very late letter, there is he's calling out a murder that is going to happen that night. Yeah. So they... They get dressed and, well, they're already dressed, but they get their stuff together and take a train over to um, whatever begins with a C. Oh, man. Tristan. Tristan. Tristan, yes. Oh, I thought you were, I was like, yes. <laughs> Tristan? No. <laughs> I was, I, honestly, that wasn't a joke. I was like, what, what? What did I do? Like, I don't remember. <laughs> so, uh, they go to Tristan and... Um, a short while later, they learn of the murder of the very wealthy man, Carmichael Clark. Yeah. Was found on, on the billiard table. Yeah. With his shoes missing, which was weird. <laughs> Maybe it's a Tarantino thing. <laughs> then the socks would have been missing. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's right. Cool. My bad. So, yes, uh, Mr. Carmichael Clark had been, has been murdered. Um, gotta love the attention for the alliteration. Carmichael mm-hmm. Clark. In, is it but, a really nice name? It is. It's a very nice name. Uh, I believe we mentioned in the last episode that we talked about this book in that we have a friend named Cameron Clark. Yeah. And yes. it is very, very difficult for me to hear the name mm-hmm. Carmichael Clark and not think of uh cameron who also has such an alliterative alliterative name oh i just Mm -hmm. leaned in and just as i was reading i just i just pictured cameron's voice and face yeah despite the fact that cameron is like 40 years too young to be (laughs) carmichael clark (laughs) whenever i hear the the name carmichael i do picture you know uh Steve Carell's face from the office on like Lightning McQueen's body. Okay, cool. fair what? enough. <laughs> Carmichael, like Michael. Like, there's so many like other like Carmichaels that like like name two. Come on, Come Susie on. Carmichael, Gerard oh. Carmichael. Tightwa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So he has an elderly. He well, he had an elderly mother. Um, because he's dead, so he doesn't have her anymore. That uh, is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Like factually correct, but it just yeah. <laughs> uh, you always made me cry. It's the heat. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I just had caffeine and alcohol at the same time. Wait, no. They don't find him on the billiard table. No. Okay. Oh, right. They put him on. They put him on the billiard table. table. Oh. He's found in the rain. Oh. In with the, the rain. ABC on his back. Uh, right. Also, we should talk about the ABC. So the ABC oh, yeah, the <laughs> is, is, is a railway guide uh, that they find uh, next to or around each of the bodies. And when mm-hmm. we read the book, I was thinking that... This little guide was like the little train schedules I used to get at Grand Central Station. Mm, like a cheap track? Sure. Yeah. That's uh, really small and like you put it in your wallet. No, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. This thing is full phone book size yeah. Yeah. book. It's It looks like something you carry around in your backpack and it would be it would hurt very much. Yeah. It was, in, fun fact, it was the inspiration for uh, all of Tolkien's writings. <laughs> <laughs> zing uh, <laughs> thank you thank you for your zing you're welcome <laughs> so yes we have uh, all of the bodies are discovered with the ABC railway guide like next to them around them or underneath them the whole shebang 
under their wigs. Like, it's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Inside their stomachs. Uh, <laughs> what is this, seven? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so, I, so, yes, this, uh, his mother, Clark's mother, had been, um, has been very, very ill. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also meet his brother, whose name is, I don't remember. Schmar Michael, if you can mm-hmm. believe. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I lie? <laughs> I just am saying you're mistaken. That's all. Oh, okay. Do you want me to look up the actual name or are we going to go with Schmar Michael? Like Franklin? Presence? Sure. Now I'm picturing the turtle. <laughs> Um, and we also meet Thora Gray, who yes. Yes. is a v- is very pretty, and Hastings. Oh my god! Again, he can't, he can't stop. I was like, "Hello!" <laughs> he, he when she passes by, and it's another one of those moments that has happened many times before in this television show, where it's like, just think the thought in your head, Hastings. Don't say it out loud. What are you doing, buddy? Yeah. Uh, Tyler was right. It's Franklin. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hey, um, it's Franklin. Mm-hmm, it's Franklin. And also, there's a compilation on YouTube of, of Hastings just going, good lord. <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> I love Perfect. that. Perfect. Yes, of course yeah. there is. Also, I mean, just one thing about because I think I'll forget when my review comes around for this. Sure, sure, sure. We have an hour and 45 minutes of this movie and not mm-hmm. one reference or sight of Miss Lemon. And I was real yeah. sad about it. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm. yeah, she's... That gone. is that is true. Yeah. But, um, uh... So... I also wanted to say mm-hmm. something yes. before I moved on. It's Please. a really nice moment when they first find... I think they find the second ABC. And Poirot is like... Uh, Jap gives some reason. He's like, oh, he's going alphabetically and it's this. And yeah. Poirot's like, oh, and he's like, yeah, we've heard of psychology at Scotland Yard too, Poirot. It's a very nice moment. Yeah. <laughs> it's just very playful ribbing. And once again, like we said before, like all these actors are like perfect of like, yeah. they all like each other. Jap yeah. is in this and he is in just his best form. Like, <gasps> I'm sorry, I forgot about something. It opens when we first meet Jad. He's on the phone with his wife. Mm hmm. <laughs> Who's asking him to pick things up after work? And he's like, I can't go around with sausages in my bag all day, can I? <laughs> <laughs> Which is so... That, oh. that made me laugh out loud. It hasn't stopped me. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know I like a good hot diggity dog, you know? Yeah. Mm. I oh, once boy. put away five hot dogs at once. <laughs> I think it's the second time you've mentioned that on the podcast. <laughs> I like a hot dog. What can I say? You can tell mm-hmm. it's the second episode we've recorded today because we're talking about food now. <laughs> <laughs> you, love it. you love to see us talk about food. <laughs> uh. We're getting hungry. Mm-hmm. Yes. I got a rumbling, um, rumbling. I should also mention uh, it happens intermittently. Like it's not like it doesn't matter the sequence in which it happens. Like we won't talk about it i think because it's not a big too big a deal but the press is like full on covering uh yeah. these murders mm-hmm. seemingly calling poirot an idiot while praising jap like mm-hmm. his headlines <laughs> his and worst hastings, nightmare yeah and hastings at one point is even misquoted to make it seem like he thinks poirot is incompetent yes yeah and actually poirot to his credit says, you know what, this actually might work to our advantage. So it reminds me a little bit of the Zodiac letters. Um, mm. Because when Zodiac was doing his whole thing, there, you know, you when someone's sending you letters, they want them published, generally. Yeah. And it's like, okay, do we do this? Um, yeah. It's like, do we negotiate with this? Uh, Because at one point, of course, I mean, ABC wasn't doing this, but Zodiac was certainly, like, threatening to, like, blow up busloads of children if Mm. they didn't publish his letters. 
So mm-hmm. it's yeah. the the press is always really you know it's always really a um a double edged sword with with publishing the letters because um you never know if it's going to be if it's going to encourage the killer or if it's going to help in some way. Right. Um, Zodiac, when they uh, published some of his stuff, uh, they did, there was a cipher. Um, and some some things did end up uh, being gleaned out of the cipher. So it was useful in some ways. But, um, but yeah, they never fully solved it. Anyway. Yeah, and that was a huge plot line that I was missing from the film adaptation of Kiss the Girls, because that is in the book quite heavily. Ah. Yeah. yeah. I remember you'd mentioned that. And it makes it make less sense, but... Yeah, yeah, it does... Well, I'm sure it made more sense in the actual book. Yeah, because like, there's time, a lot of stuff that, gets yeah. cut. That's right. what I mean. Uh, yeah. But yes, regardless... Speaking of adaptations... We're, we're reviewing one. Oh, right, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Flawless I so hard segue. On this I can't work this way anymore. I try so hard on this point. <laughs> <laughs> try typing it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Yes, we get a letter to Poirot, mm-hmm. and they tell us the name of the next town, which is... Uh, Dorset? Nope. Dor- D- uh, Dirigible? D- Dunham? 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 Ja- no. Jeffafa Dunham? Uh, d- it's a it's a D town. Devonshire. Um, Devonshire. Okay. I don't know. I'm just. No. I thought it was. Give me one second. Let me look. That's a TV series. I want the book. I want the book. Bexel. Doncaster. 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 Yeah. Okay, Doncaster. yes. Doncaster. So, uh, they find out that there's going to be horse races there. So they go to this huge horse race, and they've now collected all of the people from the other murders, and they're all along for the ride. It's really funny, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, made, it's made a bigger fuss in the book because they're all helping try to solve the case. Yeah, like, yeah. That's, but and we go back to them a lot more in the book, whereas here they're just like, as you say, they're collecting them. Yeah. And a bit oh. of trivia: I heard that you know they wanted uh, Vanessa Redgrave for a cameo, but then one of the producers was like Doncaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing now at Tristan's face because. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh you hate oh. to hear it folks. <laughs> uh so just <laughs> to momentarily go back before this we have put a when we were interviewing Cara michael clark's mom uh she mentions that she saw thora talking to a stranger and thora had said she hadn't seen anybody unusual come on the grounds that day. And we get an interview with Thora where Poirot gets her to remember that she did see, uh, you know, one of those stocking salesmen's that's like a veteran. I guess this happened a lot. And so she felt really bad for the guy, but she didn't want any stockings. So we get the, like, connection that there's a stocking salesman. Yes. And he's wearing, like, a big overcoat and a hat. Yes. And... Then it pan- once they get this information, two things. Number one, it pans over to Jap, who, of course, is wearing a big coat and a hat. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. what are you implying? True. <laughs> so throughout this, we've also been seeing a uh, an older man um, with some round, round glasses, uh, you know, watching movies and then uh, sitting with his housekeeper. And yeah, going to uh, the library, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you kind of are putting together that he is probably our suspect, yeah. Uh, and he has a whole case full of stockings, um, yeah. 
because you see him also, his housekeeper interviews him, and he seems, like, really out of sorts, but says that he has to travel to Doncaster? Yes. To to another place. He lies, but he is going to Doncaster. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... Crichton? I think he's going to Crichton. Sure. But he, uh, he does go, and so, you know, we, the audience know who the suspect is but of course Poirot Mm -hmm. and everybody else they do not know which is a fun thing that was also in the book and it was kind of jarring when we read it we jump away from Poirot and Hastings and I was like what is happening yeah and yeah because in the introduction to the book Hastings is like I recollect this and then I also um tried to piece together what I could of this other person Right. Yeah. And that was an interesting break from form from Agatha. For, yeah, for Agatha. So that, that's nice. Yes. So we see everybody's at this giant horse race. It's super crowded. These horses are huge. Enormous horses. <laughs> uh, and then we... Uh, Poirot is kind of realizing, okay, the best place for a murder is someone who's hiding in plain sight. And he calls Hastings over to him, and Hastings says exactly the right things, and Poirot's like, precisely! And then we get a cutscene to the cinema, uh, and our our friend with the glasses, with the stockings, goes we do, over... We do know he's Mr. Cust, at least at yes. this point, right? Yes, Mr. Okay. Cust. So Mr. Cust goes over to a man and stabs him in the back. Yep. Uh, yes. And then there's a very upsetting moment where uh, someone is trying to get by him and, you know, tries to wake him up. It looks like he's fallen asleep. His head is kind of lolled over to one side. Uh, and he's like, starts shaking him. And then the usher comes over and starts trying to get him awake. And then he pulls his hand up and it's there's blood on it. Yeah. Um, and I, so they... Mm-hmm. I, it did, unfortunately, make me laugh because they do show the stabbing. And then it cuts to the screen. It says yeah. the end, and I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, I did notice that too." I made me laugh out loud. I was like, "That's very jarring." Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I wanted to talk about another shot that happened before, if you don't mind. Go for it. Um, at the horse race, mm-hmm. they have this wonderful shot of all the horses galloping past camera, and then it switches to a shot of a train going past camera. And there are a lot of really cool edits in this movie, is like that, like the from a movie making standpoint, it's quite good, and you can tell that like, since it's season four, they really got their ducks in a row. Yeah. So they uh, <clears throat> they learn about this murder. Uh, I don't think we really discussed the name of the guy that was murdered, do we? No. no. Not in this. In we, the book, we do. Yeah. In the book, it's really important. But for some reason in this, it's, like, shoved to the side. No, it actually kind of works that they don't discuss it. Because yeah. it doesn't really end up mattering. In the book, they talk about how, like, he killed the wrong guy. And uh, yeah. he was supposed to have killed someone with a, a D last name. And it ended up being a guy with an E last name. Um, but by this point, Poirot has put enough together. Yeah that he suspects someone. So they but they uh do find Mr. Cust uh through a bunch of different clues. Um the the person at the hotel where he's been staying uh noticed that he was out of sorts and uh that his name was ABC from like when he signed in at the register. Mm-hmm. So he, Alexander Bonaparte Cust is his mm-hmm. name. So he is ABC. Yeah. Right. And he also comes back from the cinema and he's washing uh, blood off his hands because he's gone to, into his coat pocket and he's found a knife and a rag drenched in blood. Yeah. And so he gets that on his hands and he starts washing his hands and the housekeeper comes in, the hotel keeper or whatever. Yeah. Um, and he's like, you good? Snitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we get everybody. We get everybody here. And uh, so Poirot's here, Jap's here. And um, they find the 
suitcase full of stockings under his bed, and then they find the knife, which mm. is bloody. Yeah. This it, guy is not good at disposing of his his stuff. And the typewriter. Oh, and yeah. the, Yes, and the typewriter upon which... Upon which these letters have been written. <laughs> <laughs> on which the letters have been written to Poirot. Yeah. Um, what's really fun about typewriters is that, like, all of them are a little bit different, so you can mm. tell which typewriter is which. They mentioned earlier in the episode at some point, like, oh, yes, all these letters were definitely written by the same typewriter. Mm-hmm. So uh, they have the, he has the typewriter there that he has brought with him, which is amazing that people used to do that. Um, but, yes, so... They arrest him, he's in custody, um, and he's clearly, like, May not I? having a good time of it, yes. Um, they don't precisely arrest him. He sure. Goes back to his home, mm-hmm. and has a weird sort of dizzy spell, and he goes to the police station, yeah. being overwhelmed by all these voices, and he's clearly having like some sort of very difficult time and he's touching his head and he's clearly in pain. Mm -hmm. And then he faints once he gets to the police station and he pseudo turns himself in. Okay, yes. Um, But he is in custody now. Yeah. So Poirot goes to see him and has a little chat with him. Uh, And Poirot kind of susses out that he has not been doing this of his own accord. Mm -hmm. Someone was sending him letters, hiring him, in quotes, I'm doing air quotes, everyone can see. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Hiring him as the stocking salesman, and then basically compelling him to do all these murders. Yeah, and he has epilepsy. And sometimes when you have epilepsy, you have uh, chunks of your memory that are gone. Yeah. So he um, Cust's supposes that he has done it during these blackouts. Sure. Yes. So, uh, but he knows that during the Bexall murder, he could not have done it because he has a memory of being in a completely different place. Yes. And there was also uh, the person he was playing with goes to the police and was like, hey, about this murder, like, I was with this guy. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's revealed that he was playing dominoes one time on his lunch break. And mm-hmm. this guy comes up and he says this really whack thing. And he's like, you're going to be the most celebrated man in England, mm-hmm. but you'll probably hang for it. Yeah. And then he's like, that deeply disturbed me. And then he said it was a joke. And I didn't like that interaction. <laughs> yeah. So you Remember, like, joke with your friends about, like, like, oh, like, I can't, like, I see you being, like, so famous in life, but, like, you're probably, like, gonna die. A really horrific death. Like, you don't joke with your friends like that? No, no. it's, it's not No? Right. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll evaluate myself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Tyler, you've joked with me about that way, and then I cried, and then we had to go and see, you know, somebody about it. Oh, well, that wasn't a joke, Tristan. (laughs) And it starts again. Give me your tears. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. But anyway, Uh, (laughs) this weird guy goes up to a total stranger during his lunch break and says, hmm, you're probably going to get hung Hanged. I was going to yep. say. Yeah. <laughs> Jessica Fletcher comes through the TV. <laughs> and says, Listen, you. Um, but yeah. I think, is it about time to take an ad break? I think it is. Everybody, I want to thank all of you for listening to our podcast. Um, you can find us and a bunch of other podcasts on the Scavengers Network, the scavengersnetwork.com. You got you got a bunch of good content there and some live streams. Please go to that. Uh, go to scavengersnetwork.com. They got a bunch of cool um, uh, 
Colin, who, who runs the whole thing, has been doing a Nuzlocke run of Pokemon, which is a way you can play Pokemon with certain rules, and it makes it more difficult and uh, more entertaining. That's so check fun. that out too. Yeah, I love a good Nuzlocke. <laughs> You can find us, in particular, on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ADCPod. We also have a Facebook group you can join. Please answer the questions. If you don't answer the questions, how do I know you're not a bot? I don't. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) uh, but you can chat about episodes there. Uh, We want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Talk to us. We crave attention. (laughs) And give us a nice uh, five-star review on your podcast app of choice. Thanks. Please do. Um, Also, we just started doing this new thing. Melissa has been very kind to transcribe our episodes. So you can go to our Patreon or we have a WordPress. That's wordpress.adcpod.com. Or the Facebook. It's all over the place. So if you want to read our episodes too or know someone who wants to engage with us, but needs to read them rather than listen to them. They're there for you. Yes, and by they, he means uh, one is probably yeah. two or three at this point. Uh, yeah. But it is uh, going to be a project. Mm-hmm. Um, it, they will all be up at some point. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so more recent episodes should be up yeah. sooner than the older ones. Yeah, God, God bless you for going through our our archive because I know a couple yeah. of those are just like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> is what I have to say. <laughs> our audio has improved considerably, at well, least. Yes, and I think the overtalk has as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're trying, guys. We're trying. <laughs> Do you want to spend a dollar? <laughs> At this level, you will you receive bonus episodes and content you will find. Subscribe to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash ADC pod. For a dollar a month, you get what I just attempted to sing. At the three dollar level, <laughs> you receive early access to all the shows. At $10 a month, you can even place an ad for yourself or your business during the show, as well as the uh, uh, the previously mentioned perks. So visit patreon.com slash adcpod today. Do we have any goals on our Patreon? Uh, to make money and to get people to listen to oh, the just... <laughs> No. <laughs> no. Uh, if we reach uh, 10 patrons, we will also start to uh, record commentaries uh, for different films and TV show episodes and the like. Mm-hmm. So up those numbers for Please. a dollar at a time. We have an important message from the hosts of the Amateur Detective Club. In light of recent events, thank you for listening. I am angry. I am frustrated. And I'm sad. These killings have got to stop. You can say all lives matter six way till Sunday, but until black lives matter, that isn't a reality. It's an omission of truth. It's people in privileged positions turning a blind eye to what has always been a systemic and institutionalized effort to keep a certain balance of power in this country. It can take one and a half to two years to become an officer, depending on your state, and that simply isn't enough. We have civilians who are expected to remain calm when their lives are being threatened, but we allow our officers to act on impulse and panic. We have seen the disparity of unarmed black encounters with the police and that of unarmed and armed white encounters with police. And it is clear as day. We do not treat everyone the same. We have also witnessed the inciting of violence by the police just as much as we have seen it from protesters. One group isn't any more thug than the other. Gangs and police have the same protocol. They expect you to stand by no matter what and not snitch. 
So to those who say not all cops are bad, well, until we start seeing more cops breaking ranks and whistleblowing, then we have bad cops and complicit cops. The police are supposed to be the best of us, but they have proven they are not, and they do not protect and serve all. I do not have the answers, and I don't pretend to have them. But I hope we truly take this time and invest in our local elections and start to hold our governors, mayors, attorney generals, and sheriffs accountable. We need to push for police oversight committees. We need to make our voices heard. It's hard to know what to say from a position of privilege. But what I think is important, what I have been told and have heard is important, is listening and saying that we stand with you. And what we want to do is, is learn and to, to learn how to be better allies. So please listen where you, can't, where you have no words. Listen, work to be better. And Black Lives Matter. Say it loud and clear. I'm coming from a, I'm coming from a perspective of being a native Minnesotan. And I think one of the major reasons that these events have occurred in that state is Minnesota has always seen itself as one of the good guys. We pride ourselves on being the first state to join the Union during the Civil War. And I believe that fact makes us think that we are absolved of any racism that is abundantly clear to be not the case. Now, the Minnesota Freedom Fund, which is a wonderful organization, has received an overwhelming response during this time. They have recommended a few other organizations to donate to, and I would also recommend that you do the same. There is a great network called Unicorn Riot, and they've been covering all the events in Minneapolis and also in other states using live streams. There's also Reclaim the Block, which is a grassroots group that combat the power and funds of the Minneapolis Police Union. And there's also North Star Health Collective, which is just what it sounds like, a collective to help those who need health services in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. There's also a bunch of bunch more local groups that you can help with for uh, the people who have been protesting. Um, and Atlanta, atlsolidaritynetwork.org. Chicago, chicagobond.org slash donate. Louisville is actionnetwork.org. In Brooklyn, it is brooklynbailfund.org slash donate. The Bronx, the Bronx Freedom Fund dot org. Philadelphia, phillybailout.com slash donate. And Los Angeles, gofundme.com and find People's City Council Ticket Fund. Poirot is all like, it can't be him, it can't be him. Jeff is like, why this time? And he gathers everybody around, Poirot does, and he, he's very dramatic, in a hotel that, with the spiral staircase that we've seen in, twice before in this movie. It's, it's someone's home, right? It's the it's resort. No, home? It's, it's the resort where uh, okay. Betty worked. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. It is also in at least three other episodes of Pearl Poirot. <laughs> they that reuse this set a lot. It's, it's like the I mean, cave set in Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yep. So he's gathered everybody up, and he's going through with suspects one by one. And he finally settles on... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
mean, you sunk the shot. <laughs> but you... <laughs> oh my god, that was <laughs> that was like passing place. Someone go one by one. Oh god. Uh, but <laughs> so. <I> mean... uh... <laughs> Essentially, we find, um, and I'm going to semi-butcher this, but we find that this, there were two people involved in all of these murders. Mm -hmm. One, a willing participant, and one, an unknowing participant. The same man who visited Cust uh, and played dominoes with him was the same person that hired him to sell these stockings to specific places. Um, I don't think at certain times necessarily, but at these places, about mm-hmm. in all these different towns, the day that these murders begin to happen. Yes. We then find that the culprit is Franklin Clark. He killed... All the murders happen as Poirot suggested earlier, to cover up that big murder. Right. Because the mother is going to die. And uh, so Carmichael is going to inherit everything. He thinks, uh, the brother thinks that he's going to get married to Thora Gray. And they're going to get everything and everything's going to, just work out super for him and but Franklin wants all the money basically right mhm yes and and we oh go ahead Tristan and the way he Poirot comes to this conclusion is there's fingerprints on the typewriter that match um Franklin's and because up until this point, Franklin is like, oh, I couldn't, uh, it's a bunch of rot. And then he said, Poro says that. And then he has a moment where he just like looks at everybody and then just runs away. <laughs> it's oh, but very he funny. calls them something and it was so good, but I can't remember what the word was. It was so outlandish. Uh, but, yeah. but then he like runs into a theater and I'm like, yeah. Why didn't we get the reveal there? <gasps> yeah. Absolutely. It would have been so much cooler. Uh, but, but he, they... like, hides, like, in, like, the seating of the theater. And, like, doesn't even wait for them to, like, even begin to leave the theater before he jumps <laughs> up and starts <laughs> running on the tops of the seats, try, like, trying to get out. He eventually uh. gets tackled. But I was like, why wouldn't you just wait till like they I left did. the room? So silly. <sighs> So they catch him. The murders are solved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we go back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Jap has this great moment. Like they, they're they looking down at him getting put the cop cart pans up to Jap. And he just goes, well, I guess that's that then. And then he walks off frame. <laughs> and like, that's Jap in a nutshell. <laughs> it's so Amazing. good. And then we see him. That's putting... how every episode of Just Jap should end. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess that's that then, eh? Um, and you see, we also see Jap at some point, um, putting sausages in his bag out of his locker. <laughs> oh, oh gosh. No. Yeah. But oh, Melissa, so you were saying. A scene. Uh, so the end of the episode, we're back at the flat of Poirot. Hastings is there. So is the Cayman. Uh, and, uh, we have our friend, um, uh, Mr. ABC himself, Cust comes in and says, Mr. Poirot, I want to thank you so much for helping me, uh, for solving this. I, you know, they want to offer me a book deal. And so Poirot says, ah, you got to ask for more money. And then he sees the Cayman and he looks very taken with it. And Hastings finally gets to tell him the story of how he shot it. Mm -hmm. And that's the end. So easy, a Cayman could do it. <laughs> there you go. You're in good hands. Um, what did what did y'all think of this one? Uh, I really liked it. I actually think I liked it more than the book. 
or Ooh. or I liked it more than the book because I already knew it was going to happen and I liked the way they adapted it. I'm not sure which, uh, but I'm going to give it a solid 8 out of 10. Um, very enjoyable. It bothered me less than it did in the book because I think what happened was... So in the book, I was very disappointed um, that we didn't just have a serial killer. And I thought that the psychology of the killer was kind of all a mess. Uh, and in seeing it the second time and knowing how it unfolds, uh, they did a really good job with it. And they trimmed some of it in a way that made uh, a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it just flowed better for me, I guess. And... Uh, they made the so he's trying to set it up as it looks like the work of an a relatively organized serial killer um but it doesn't end up following that pattern so essentially i've lost the train of my thought and that's kind of how it felt <laughs> what i'm saying is that's how the book felt to me that's how the book felt to me I felt yeah. like this handled it better. It was just tidier. I would give it... I would give it a 7 out of 10. Uh, I thought John Malkovich has never been better. Peak Poirot. <laughs> really, really great job. Wait, did we did we not watch the same adaptation? <laughs> uh, we're going to eventually have to get around to that. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, Rupert I Grint just... is in it, and I am all in on Rupert Grint. Okay. Mm. I, uh, I'm i all in on him as well. There's someone else in the cast that I'm not all in. And, and, and that's that's fair, and I feel that. Uh, so, like, I I think it's going to be fun. Oh, like, I don't yeah, know if it's absolutely. Gonna be... <laughs> <laughs> I, can't just, I can't wait to hear what weird-ass voice he decides to do. Yeah. Uh, but back to the adaptation that we watched with David Suchet and Hugh Fraser. Um, I had a lot of fun and also echoing Melissa's thoughts. Like I, I do, I do know that I like this more than I like the book because it just streamlined so, uh, many things from the book that I just found unnecessary and things were a bit clearer. Um, it took points off for me, maybe just because of the mood that I was kind of in. But this director was very heavy-handed in the subtlety of things. He was like, mm. I feel like in his mind, they were suddenly like, oh, like, this is like really, this is really going to get him. When I like pan in on this B in this poster for like the second oh, yeah. murder, because it's also a B. I was that like, was very okay, silly. You're doing the most, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like it wasn't enough for like me to like dislike it. It was just kind of like, all right, like people are being murdered. It's like this isn't a comedy, <laughs> friend. <laughs> uh, so, this isn't murder. That, that was just it for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I really did enjoy it. Uh, seven out of ten. Yeah, I'd say an eight out of ten as well. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, I think it is a solid adaptation. They really streamlined the story, which I was grateful for going into, once I realized it was the ABC murders, I was like, oh no. And then it was great. Um, very well done. I'm going to say the acting in this really elevated everything as well. Um, not just the core cast, but the guy that plays Cust is really, really good. Because he is just doesn't know what's going on, and he's very frightened. And the actor is quite good, and I he got a lot of sympathy out of me. I think a lot of the humorous parts, it, like I think it's it was very successful joke wise. Um, I understand what you're saying, Tyler. I love the corniness of this show. It is a huge part of why I love it. <laughs> um, so I didn't mind that, but there were also other shots, like the one I mentioned before, of the, the horses and then the train. Like, there was a lot of solid, like, cinematography and editing as well. As, like, yeah. as far as a movie goes, it was also well edited and, like, well paced, which I was really grateful for. Because sometimes these episodes are not... <laughs> yeah, even the regular length, sometimes. I now call this meeting of the Amateur Detective Club to a close. 
gavel sound. Oh, gosh. 